Yeah, I was just saying, it's. Uh, I've, I've made a rod for my own back. You watch one stupid, silly bullshit video, and then the algorithm all of a sudden seems to think that you like stupid, silly bullshit videos, and so it keeps sending you more and more of them. And further down the shit hole you tend to go. And I've got pretty deep and dark in this hole of shit, of stupid, silly bullshit, of people sticking fingers into things that really don't need to be having fingers stuck into them for a therapeutic benefit, you know, for some enjoyment and pleasure, maybe elsewhere than in bedroom circumstances. But, you know, for a, for a therapist to be doing this as a, under the guise of treatment, no, I think it's, uh, it's stretching the realms of plausibility way too far. Um, for those that don't know who you are, go ahead and introduce yourself, though, Coach, just so they're... Okay, do you want the long or short version? The Man, we got plenty version? of time. I don't want to bastardize it, so that's why I'm letting you do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, well, my name's Adam, and uh, in a nutshell, I'm a physiotherapist, or physical therapist, which I think you incorrectly call them over in the US. Um, have been a physiotherapist for just over 20 years. Haven't always been a physio, so I came into it as my third career. Really? So, uh, don't let these youthful looks confuse you. I've been around the block a few times. Uh, <laughs> So I came out of the uh, school system, the academic system, at a tender age of 18. I went into the military for a couple of years. Thank you for your had, service. Had, yeah, I had aspirations of staying in there for a long duration and a long time to make a career out of it. But as things tend to happen, life comes around and makes plans change. Um, won't go into the gory details, but it, let's just say it was based around a woman. Hmm. say no more uh, and so I left the military a little bit earlier than I anticipated came out onto CV Street and didn't have a fucking clue what to do with myself uh, so I thought you know what I'm the fittest I've ever been so I'm going to use that to my advantage and became a glorified personal trainer for a couple of months wanted to get some sort of you know credibility behind that title that I just bestowed upon myself so I went to university and did a degree in sports science which I rather naively thought would give me some more credentials and make me more employable. And uh, I came out after three years of doing that degree thinking, well, this is a fucking worthless degree. Nobody fucking understands what it is and it's not really giving me any opportunities apart from working in some professional sports clubs, which are very few and far between. Unless you've got contacts in there, you're unlikely to get your, your foot in the door. So. I started carrying on, I carried on working as a glorified personal trainer who was overqualified with this degree and uh, then started to come across people that had pain and injuries and that started to pique my interest, not sure what to do, how to progress with that and I thought, you know what, I'm going to start exploring a bit more down into that area and that's what eventually led me into physiotherapy and that was, I say, 20 odd years ago. So that's me in a nutshell. <clears throat> Why do you say that the word physio is better than physical therapist? because it just is it's it sounds more glamorous it sounds more mysterious it sounds more i think scientific as well physiotherapist rather than a physical therapist i agree with you um what do you think is the problem with physios and do you like the word strength and conditioning coach or strength what's the word you like what's your appropriate vernacular well, I, again, I've, I've bastardized my qualification to say that I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but really, technically, I'm not. I haven't done any sort of formal. I mean, but history. what's the difference, realistically? Like, it... Well, yeah, I mean, the sports science degree I had taught me a, there was a lot of crossover, um, but it was more focused around, you know, exercise physiology and the science of sport, kinesiology, rather than just pure strength and conditioning training. But there was certainly a lot of crossover. But I, I suppose technically sports scientist is what my first Bachelor of Science degree is in. And then physiotherapy is what my second one is. But what I think the problem is, is with physio, is, um, well, where to begin? <laughs> I've, got, I've got lots of problems with the physiotherapy profession after working in it for two decades. But I think um, arrogance, egotisticalness, over complexity, uh, taking credit for things that it doesn't deserve to take credit for, claiming that it's better than other healthcare professions out there, having this pompous, arrogant, hierarchical, uh, elitist type of approach, which I don't think it deserves or gets much credit or deserves much credit. And yeah, just, just a sh shitload of stupid nonsense that infests the profession, mate. That's what I think is the problem with physiotherapy. I agree with you um, about the hierarchy too because one of my buddies here is a physio <clears throat> and we were actually talking about this the other day because 
you know, a lot of these structures set it up where there's like a hierarchy where it's like, okay, immediate injury that you got, maybe if it's surgery, the, you know, surgeon's in charge, then it's the, phys the physio, then it's the ATC. And like, that's got to just be the problem with, like you said, with the degrees sucking, it's got to be academic, right? Like, how do we blow that whole thing up? I don't know how to blow it up, mate. I've been trying for years to, to get the profession to change and to recognize, you know, what it is good at and what it's not so good at and give it some sort of a little bit more honesty and humility. And I don't think I've been very successful in doing that. So I don't know how to change it. But no, I think I think a lot of physiotherapists lack of confidence in doing the simple things really well stems for their the inferiority complexes. And I think, it, again, it's the medical system that a lot of us work in. We always feel second best or subservient to our medical colleagues to the doctors and to the surgeons and, and i think there's a lot of inferiority complex in physiotherapy for that and so they try to they try to make up for that by over complicating and over conflating a shitload of what they do in, in a in a in an attempt to what they think is a belief to to make themselves appear more medical to make them appear more more you know intelligent than they actually are and it fucking frustrates the hell out of me particularly in the uk now i'm seeing more and more physios running around pretending to be junior doctors there's a lot of heavy promotion and pushing for physiotherapists careers to go into the medical side of it so we're seeing a lot of young physios being promoted to you know start talking about prescriptions pharmacology pharmacology what? Doing injection. Yeah, I mean, I've been trained in it as well. In my NHS career now, I'm a diagnostic ultrasonographer, so I've been trained to be doing radiology interventions. I've been trained to, say, prescribe medications, to do injections, all because this is what, again, a lot of physios believe this is where their skills evolve in. And I do see some people doing it well, but I also see a lot of the physios just, say, running around pretending to be junior doctors, and it's embarrassing and it frustrates me a lot. And the consequence of that is that a lot of the physiotherapy in the UK now has moved away from its roots, which is good quality injury diagnosis, pain diagnosis and rehabilitation. You know, there's no financial incentive or reward or career prospects for physios just to want to be good at getting people functioning and back doing what they need to be doing after an episode of pain and injury. It's all about interventions with medicines and injections and ultrasounds now. And it, it is depressing and it does frustrate me a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, you could almost say the same thing about strength and conditioning, and that's kind of why I asked you, um, but what's the difference? Because <clears throat> I'm very fortunate where I work. Um, the athletic trainer I work with, he's awesome. And I joke, uh, I say, are you a strength coach? Are you an athletic trainer? Because um, when I'm training the whole team, if there's somebody in a, in a return to play setting, he takes him and he's off doing what he needs to do, you know, regressing it. And, you know, Kyle, my athletic trainer, has taken the time to learn what dribbles are, learn my progressions and regressions to, to do those things. And if I'm training the whole team and he's training somebody one on one, well, isn't he technically being a strength and conditioning coach in that moment? Right. And then when we're in practice and the whole team is there and they need the ATCs monitoring everybody and I'm rehabbing somebody, well, am I being an athletic trainer or physio? Like, that's why there doesn't need to be all these silos, right? And we, we can blur the lines, no? No, I totally agree, mate. But again, it's just that inferiority complexes of not wanting to feel like you're having somebody step on your toes or take away your your skill set and it's just all that protective mentality that i think a lot of the professions tend to have this is my role this is what i should do you know this is where my skills are therefore you know you stick to what you're doing i stick to what i do but as you say there's a lot of crossover and a lot of overlap and i think there's a lot to be learned from each other you know i, I think i've I, I class myself as a better physio for for aligning myself more with you know strength coaches personal trainers athletic trainers i find that i've learned a shitload more from them <laughs> than other than just sticking in my silo and listening to to physios because i'd still be thinking you know i could feel sacroiliac joints out of place and trigger points and fascial adhesions if i only carried on just listening to physios i'd be thinking all sorts of stupid bullshit but the fact my eyes have been opened and my you know horizons broaden has come from my interaction and interdisciplinary working with other professions you think it's because people are employed as educators but have never done it and haven't played sport themselves so like i was talking with my wife that the teachers for strength and conditioning profession usually never even were fucking strength coaches in their day-to-day -day. like so why in the hell should they be educating the youth yeah i think that's a part of it um 
but I, 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 the reasons why people get you know dogmatic or you know, stuck in their ways is due to lots of different things. You know, there's a lot of cognitive fallacies that can drive people to not want to listen to ulterior motive or ulterior hypotheses and things along those lines. But I think a part of it is, you know, a lot of people, you know, they lack exposure or experience to things that they're asking other people to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I used to have a, a saying that I think, you know, it's all good for a, a physio or an athletic trainer, you know, particularly if you're demonstrating exercises, to be able to be able to do that art exercise that you ask your athletes and stuff to do. But again, mm -hmm. I think that's dependent on the type of individuals you're working with. Because uh, again, I work with some very strong, very fit athletic people that are able to do a shitload of things better than I could do as a physiotherapist. So, but I do believe, you know, that practicing what you preach is important. Yeah. Um, one last question before we change topics. Do you think that, you know, kind of the governing bodies continue to have that siloed approach? Do you think there's ever going to be a way that they can blend it and then... <laughs> Don't get me started on the governing bodies, mate. I just <laughs> did. Go ahead. <laughs> I could get myself in a bit of hot water here because personally I think they're, they're inept and they're not fit for purpose. And uh, I've got myself in a lot of hot water about that and I'm currently still in a lot of hot water about that. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I've got a couple of uh, legal proceedings ongoing at the moment in the background due oh. to some knobheads in positions of authority. Um, making my life a little bit difficult because of my views and opinions and using the authorities to their advantage. And to say that the authorities are, yeah, that, let's just say that my, my views and opinions on them are, are not very favorable at the moment because of that. <clears throat> Sounds good. So changing topics to people that are out there in the uh, the social media world that are social media strength coaches that have never done it themselves either. What would you say to our listeners in our demographic, right? The majority of the people listening right now are pretty young and impressionable. They're 24 to 34 um, men that are, are trying to get into the field. Looking back, um, what would you tell anybody? Get some life experience. You know, I think at the end of the day, to be a good coach, to be a good person that's going to help other people through whatever situation you want to help them through, make them perform better or get them through a period of injury or disease, you have to have some life experience of how to interact, to communicate, to motivate, to support, to reassure people. Uh, and that takes time to develop. There's no secret source to it there is no quick one-step approach to being a good coach it takes time it takes exposure and it takes a variety of say of experiences to to develop into a rounded human being because there is no one-size-fits-all approach you have to be adaptable you have to be flexible you have to be resilient and robust yourself you know both physically and psychologically and um, it's not an easy job to do it's it's something that as i say is not suitable for everybody and i find a lot of people sometimes they know it's not suitable for them yet they carry on with it for whatever reasons maybe it's just because it's difficult to think about jumping the fence and doing something difficult and so they dogmatically carry on to the detriment of themselves and to the people that they're they're helping and coaching and i say if you're you're, you're, you're feeling like this job is you know difficult and hard work good because it is um, but if you're also feeling demoralized demotivated with it then you're in the wrong fucking job and you need to consider changing it and and the other thing is is don't think it you know you're going to seek fame and fortune or wealth through it either because this is not the type of job that does that either if you've got that mindset and that mentality you're going to be sorely disappointed it requires to say that that approach where you're sometimes you're quite happy to selfishly commit your time energy and effort to make somebody else appear better and perform better and you're not going to take any credit for that. And that, that takes a certain type of personality to be ap happy to do that. You know, that takes a, a certain person. And say, a lot of people I think that are in this profession aren't those people. How did you learn how to do that? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I just talk a fucking good game. <laughs> Touche, touche, because, I mean, I'd agree with you, and I think it, uh, that reminds me, Fernando, the conversation we had with Jonas, where he was talking about, like, he was considering going to Canada, 
and uh, his mom wanted him to like Dr. Dodo was going to be like really important to, to her but he's like I just felt wrong you know saying that I'm you know a doctor of strength and conditioning speed whatever he's like but I've never worked with someone that's actually fast and I've never made people fast like I, I think you, you bring up a really good point there like if you want to be a good strength and conditioning coach physio you have to have actually worked with somebody and done it and you need to do it at a point where you're probably not getting paid for your services right like yeah, I think um, I think I can't really speak for any other professions, but what it means to be successful in this environment has been blurred. You know, like people don't even know. It's like, is are you supposed to be knowledgeable? Um, you know, win stuff. Are you supposed to be famous? Are you supposed to be who knows? And then I think with social media, what it, what it does is, I mean, it's a good tool, but it, it's about the use it gets. You know, so people just, especially the young ones, they just see flashy bits and they just think about straight into what that looks like but nothing in between they're thinking like oh I could be young and successful and skip all these steps and like coach whichever team straight away or get all these many followers or have all this money and be you know ripped and tan and whatever it's all about it's it just it's, it's a nothing like some of those things they're even like not even compatible with each other so it's this this, this orientation of, of where to go or why to do something I don't think there's a strong why I've actually been reading that book, so I'm probably like biased to talk about that one now. But I don't think it's a strong why. People, if you ask the, the professionals, none of them will be able to tell you maybe why they go in or why they're still there, why they would like to stay there. It's all about this one I'm going to do and this how I'm going to do it. But for why? What, what's the ultimate goal? Is, is it money? Because then if you are fueled by this in, you know, intrinsical um, need of you know, purpose or fulfillment or whatever, then who do you care who's watching your drills? And why do you spend time um, criticizing or fighting people on the internet? Like, it's just going in all many directions. They're pulling each other in different ways. So you end up being a nothing, right? Like, that, that's, that's, that's what I feel with the, the, the famous people. They call themselves, like, the king of speed or whatever, whatever. It's a, bl it's a horrible blend between, like, marketing, you know, banality, ego. And I don't even know what performance is anymore, to be fair. Hmm, that's an interesting rabbit hole that we could dive down. But like, that's a good point there. Like, what is it? It, it? Because that's the part too, though, with, with, you know, strength and conditioning, physios, if you're working in team sport, we're always at the liberty of being fired by admin, you know, people that have no idea what we're doing versus if you're working, you know, ideally, if you're working for private clientele, you don't have to deal with that as much. But yeah, I mean, to try to prove your worth can be difficult because you do have to sell yourself. And then that goes back into that, you know, right? Like, as you brought up the book, that's what you guys saw me turn around and do. I brought, I got this book the other day, Outlive. Have you heard of it, anybody out there, either of you guys? So it's talking about the science and art of longevity. Um, and the reason that I brought it up is it sounds, it says it's rethinking medicine to live better longer. And so it's, again, probably going to be about the idea of like, hey, we don't need to ingest or inject things in us to, you know, get our body to optimize um, – the way it should be. What are some things, you know, Adam, that you found help out your clients, your people you work with that maybe isn't, you know, just, hey, we're going to rice or we're going to inject you in some ibuprofen. Like what have you done to make people feel better and move better um, overall? And then we can kind of dive into different areas of the body. Great question. And I think, you know, the, the main thing that I do 99% of the time in a lot of my evaluations and consultations now is listen to people in, and to then give them some confident reassurance that all their fears and doubts that they have got about this issue are not as bad or not to be as concerned about. So I think that's the, the number one thing that I do as a healthcare professional 99% of the time. Because when people have a pain, an injury or a problem, you know, normal human nature is for everybody to think worst case scenarios. What's going on? What's possibly could be happening? What's going to happen in the future? And so I totally get that. You know, having a recent severe bout of ridiculous issues with my own back injury hmm. 18 months ago now. Um, you know, as a healthcare professional with lots of experience of helping other people through those situations, when it happened to me, my brain instantly went to worst case scenarios. So I know it's it happens to everybody in all sorts of situations. So. A lot of the time, as I say, my, my biggest thing of helping people get healthy 
or get recovered from an injury is is giving them reassurance after listening and giving them that sort of pathway giving them some green light to be able to know what to progress on and what to focus on which is basically keeping it simple as possible not getting too distracted by all the gadgetry and the gimmickry that's out there focus on the big rocks before you start worrying about the one percenters you know as was probably all heard before a bit cheesy but it's true a lot of people say they focus on you know do i need to take this multivitamin i'm like well fucking how many grams of protein you're eating first and foremost <laughs> you know how many calories you're shuffing down your face and what your macro is looking like before you start worrying about which brand of multivitamin to get and that's the same with physiotherapy rehab you know they talk about is this corrective exercise you know the best one to be doing i'm like well fucking are you getting your steps in are you sleeping are you <laughs> are you doing your mobility stuff you know all this sort of stuff that's the first thing before you start working about the motor control of your iliacus working at 13.5 percent of its mvic you know that stuff comes way way down the line if at all if it's ever needed so yeah i think you know to answer that question reassurance listening and focusing on the big stuff the big rocks what did you do oh, go ahead go ahead i imagine sometimes especially for you with injuries and, and the people coming in that some sort of desperation or, or sadness state is about and that's probably what infuriates you uh or one of the things uh is about undoing what other people have mm. done out of like you know that ego we say like why well, i feel important by getting someone clinging on my idea of giving them hope and all these explanations and someone's desperate when you're desperate you just, you just want to find a solution and then you'll pay whatever you have to pay for someone to you know snap your gooch and like feel better and like <laughs> so it's, it's very no no, no it's, it's over the videos but it's very i confusing. know it's, it's like you get it's like you get extorted emotionally for someone offering you a solution and this person uh might not even be trying to do that deliberately they're just like ignorant and full of themselves so they just think they can cue everyone so they just go around saying oh i got the cue for everything because they actually believe it and this this is one of the dangerous things we get in the health um care professionals and well in sport it's different because the athletes get, get promised all these things and, and most of the time or, or or the biggest difficulties i've had in the last year is just debunking myths you know they, they get convinced of something and these guys are you know talented or have the genetic predisposition or ability to overcome stupid stuff and then they think that that works and they you know it doesn't so you're just trying to help them it's just it's just really tough it's undoing the the ineptitude of others isn't it yeah, it's one of the biggest frustrations of my job, mate. It feels like it's Groundhog Day. I keep having the same discussions with different people 20 times a day, and it is, it is frustrating, and it is hard work, and it is draining emotionally for me to feel like I'm banging my head against a brick wall and making that very little progress in the grand scheme of things. But, yeah, no, it's, it's trying to unpick, you know, the nocebo, the fear, the, the focus on the stuff that doesn't matter. That's the hardest thing to do, you know, and that's why I do get frustrated at people that do continue to perpetuate these these yeah. myths on social media. And people say, why, why are you getting so worried about this? Why are you getting so frustrated? It's a small thing. And I'm like, it's not a small thing, you know, because this small thing that you think is inconsequential to you, I've seen absolutely ruin people. They focus on shit that doesn't matter. They get so concerned about stuff that you've said that they can't focus on anything else. They can't see the wood for the trees now. And so, you know, I, I see it all the time, you know, the old spinal flexion debate. I, it drives me crazy that people go around demonizing this one particular part of the body's particular movement as being, you know, the most harmful or dangerous thing in the world. And it's like, why is that? Why are we start, said that spinal flexion so bad, yet we're quite happy to do elbow flexion in a myriad of different ways you know all the <laughs> exercise prescription with your bicep variations fucking hell yeah you're the top fucking s and c coach and physiotherapist out there as soon as you start giving a variation of spinal flexion oh my god you're dangerous and you're harmful you're 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 being risky you're being that i'm like you've just given this guy 33 different bicep curls in all various different variations to hit all different parts of the targets of the heads why can't i do that to the spine oh it's different why is it different Show me the evidence where it's different. Show me the proof that it's more risky or dangerous. So things like this, I say, get me up on my oil horse all the time because I say around back pain, which is the number one thing I see a lot of, that the fears and the harms that people promote and say out there are, are the hardest thing for me to unpick. And it is, and people say, well, it's just words. Words are harmless. You know, I'm like, they're fucking not. Words are like toothpaste. 
once you squeeze them out, you can't put them back into the tube. Mm. You know, they get out there, they get fucking ingrained, they get stuck into people's psyche and beliefs and understanding. And that's how dogma gets built as yeah. well, because these words just keep going round and round and round. More people keep saying it, more people keep believing it, until you know what? Everybody's saying the same thing, which is just fucking ridiculous. Because because it's it's easier and more palatable to say the 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 stupid stuff, and then when you actually set yourself up for debate and like actual rational arguments, then you feel yourself you know, in a place of solitude because people mm -hmm. start giving you the you know the fallacies. It'll be like, well, you know, many ways lead to Rome. I was like, well, not hmm. many. It's not like everything, and and the fact that you know, in in terms of cognitive like reasoning. The fact that something worked once doesn't mean it's right. You can't really, like, normal people don't have that basic reasoning process or understanding. Be like, oh, you know what? Uh, this is this is my magic, like, tiger device. I, it fights away tigers. There's no tigers in the Midlands. Be like, Fernando, there's never been tigers in the Midlands. Oh, well, you know, not, I've had this. And then I'm selling the tiger repelling devices, you know? Like, that sort of thing. And, and, and we think it's funny. We think it's funny. But the same like reasoning chain is for many other stuff. Well, you know what? And it, it end up it end up going to the fact that people say, "Well, in my personal experience, which oh, is yeah. what was that? What was that supposed to mean?" Well, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So I, I do it. <laughs> like, how how did you treat your own back then, or did you go see somebody else? No, I uh, I did what I would recommend to anybody else is that that's the same signs and symptoms as me is keep a watchful eye on it, give it time, and keep moving. And that's pretty much what I did for a very bad bout of a posterior lateral disc herniation with radiculopathy. So, it, again, I didn't go and get scans, I didn't get imaging, I didn't go and get epidurals, I didn't get massage, I didn't get manipulation because I don't believe that those things help or improve or speed up recovery. Um, in fact, I think a lot of the times they do the opposite. They impede it because normally they're surrounded by narratives of stupid shit. So pretty much, as I say, I treated myself as I would do everybody else, which wasn't easy to do because, as I said, my mind was racing to worst case scenarios, particularly as I was documenting it on social media and I was putting it out there for the world to see. And every cunt was giving me their un, un, unsolicited, unsolicited bit of advice is, and, yeah. and information. And, you know, and, and people were always thinking and telling me of the worst case scenarios. They kept reinforcing those fears and doubts that I had constantly daily repetitively so it was hard for me to sometimes try to keep my focus on what i would suggest the patient does but yeah did you did was the pain going down both legs or just one just the one it was a it was a high disc herniation so it was l3 l4 so it created a lot of groin pain it's a slightly unusual presentation for a disc herniation because it normally happens at the lower two discs mine happened at a higher disc level so it created what i call not sciatic type symptoms it caused thematic symptoms it was anterior thigh pain rather than posterior thigh pain a lot of groin pain uh, affecting this say the higher nerve roots up there and a loss of quad strength rather than calf strength so mm. i lost about 50 percent of my left quad which was really fucking concerning that absolutely that 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 i mean pain i can sort of you know go all right fair enough take and live or take with it but when i started feeling motor deficits, muscle weakness, that very much made me go, fuck you now, all right, this is, this is something else I've got to be more concerned about because that doesn't always recover. That might be a permanent alteration now. So how did you measure when you said 50%? Were you doing leg extensions and step ups or what? So just the basic, just the basic, again, everybody says the same, how do you know you got 50%? Because I quantified it. So <laughs> I yeah, sorry, I meant to say like, what movement did you use to quantify it for our listeners? Knee, knee extensions. So I just went on a single leg knee extension machine and I worked out what my one RM was on my uh, affected side. So I just picked a weight and just worked up to the point where I couldn't uh, go beyond uh, one RM, and then I did the same thing on the other leg, and realised it was pretty much half the weight of the other side. How often were you assessing? Again, I'm asking now. I'll give you some context. I had a disc bulge, C5, six. So right side, I couldn't do a push. I, I couldn't push. Left side, couldn't pull. Um, and I got obsessive too about like kind of monitoring it. So how often were you doing it? And, and again, I'm trying to help out maybe any of our listeners out there. Like, all right, fuck, yeah. I've had this happen too. I, to be were honest, you doing it every day. Yeah, probably not quite every day, but I was monitoring it too much than I should have been. Because yeah. again, you know, there is that constant desire to see where you can see any signs of improvement. Is it changing? Is it changing? <laughs> You're talking <laughs> and, to my soul, brother. Again, yeah, <laughs> I, so I was probably doing it three, four times a week when, you know, ideally I'd have said to a patient, we'll assess this once a week or even once a fortnight because we know this, 
this motor deficits when they do recover they recover slowly and they take on average you know sometimes six to twelve months to fully yeah. recover sometimes two years yep. so this is what the literature tells us so you know I know that time period is something to have in my mind but it was very hard for me to accept so I was trying to see whether I saw changes after two or three days and then when it didn't, it got me down and depressed. And I was like, oh my God, no, I'm panicking now. It hasn't changed in two days. And I'm like, slap yourself and think, and think that's Meekins, yeah. you, wouldn't tell, you wouldn't start telling a patient to be concerned if there's no exactly. change in two days. So why are you worrying about this? There's no change in two days. Yeah. We know better, but we are terrible taking our own advice, right? We, yes, that was... We are our worst fucking clients, oh. mate. Absolutely. We are terrible our worst patients. clients. Terrible yeah. patients ourselves. So that's why I asked if you went in to, to see anybody that you recommended, just so that way it's like, all right, you don't have to worry about, you know, telling yourself it because somebody else would tell it to you, right? Like... Yeah, no, I get that. And I, and I sometimes say, you know, when a, a physician or a therapist has themselves as a patient, they have a fall for a patient. That's a famous <laughs> saying that's often banded around. Uh, and, and, and I do get that because there can be a little bit of complacency and they, things can get missed if you, you're focusing or you get too concerned on your own signs and symptoms. So having an objective third party able to assess you and help you out can be useful. But, you know, I, I, I just know that if I went to see somebody um, independently, mm. I know 90% of the time I'd have been given some information or some stuff that would have just probably been bullshit and pissed me off and I'd have gone, oh, I've just wasted my time and money there anyway. So, Kira actually posted something similar with his, uh, the fucking MCL shit or LCL. I just saw that post, yeah. He went to the uh, system and he got a shitty sheet of photocopied exercises for his rehabilitation. <laughs> exactly. And he's like, the fuck have I just wasted my time and energy for to do this? So that's exactly the thought I would have had, you know, I just, there's, a, there's no point in me going to see anybody. So I'm just going to keep a watchful eye and monitor it. But what I did have in my mind was that if it doesn't go according to plan or if anything starts to change for the negative or the detriment, then I'm going to go and see somebody. So my approach was, is that I'm not being arrogant and thinking I know it all and I can deal with it all on my own. I was going to say, you know, I would seek support or further interventions if things started to deteriorate which they didn't, they plateaued, and then they slowly improved, which is exactly what we should see. So based on that process and prognosis, I just carried on watchful monitoring. I'm wondering, and maybe our listeners out there are wondering the same exact thing, how did you know that it was going to be a disc bulge thing rather than like, oh, maybe some sort of a groin strain? If the pain, it was, I guess it's because it was radicular pain, not um, muscular pain, right? Yeah. Sorry, I answered my own yeah, question. I mean, the mechanism of injury and the signs and symptoms can, can quite reliably, 90 odd percent of the time, give us quite accurate diagnosis without the need for imaging. So there's always this debate around the need for getting an MR scan or some form of imaging to give you the 100% confirmation. And I can understand why some people want to do that, just to get that tick in the box to say, yeah, it's definitely this. But a lot of the time with these cute episodes, you know, we can, we can classify it into this sort of either specific back pain or non-specific back pain. And when we're talking specific back pain, we're talking things like disc herniations or stenosis or nerve root issues. So when we've got, you know, those signs and symptoms and we've got the mechanism and the history in the patient, we don't need to get imaging. So it's, it's listening to what the symptoms are and obviously your objective signs as well. Um, Fernando, it looked like you were going to ask something before I move on. No, no, I was just, I was just reflecting on what I do when I have to train myself and, and it's a very similar process you know sometimes I'm like I know if I go heavy I can't because I'm strong but I feel terrible for five days now nah, I'll be fine <laughs> I can't walk today and I just do it over and over again and I was thinking I have to um, you know I, I'm, I'm the worst patient ever I mean but if I that was I was going to be my question for Adam if I had to I'd probably have two or three coaches I'd go to and be like I trust you with the process um, who would that be for you Adam if you have people you know Ooh. Great. If I had to trust somebody, I think I'd trust my uh, compadre and business partner, Ben Cormack, um, who's a very good therapist when it comes to back pain. So I'd have definitely gone and sought his advice and guidance. Um, my other colleague, Greg Lehman, who's a Canadian physio and chiropractor, I trust him for sound, reasonable, rational judgment. You know, and if I needed medical advice and everything, there's a sports medicine doctor as well called James Noak, Dr. Noak, who, again, I would also perhaps go and see to talk about, you know, the medical side of it, you know, pharmacology, analgesia, injections and stuff along those lines. So yeah, there's, again, thanks to social media and network of people that I know are rational and reasonable that I would have reached out to if I needed to. Yeah, we don't oh. want to be the uh, doom and gloom podcast. There, there's a couple of good ones out there. There's yeah, of oh, course. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and they, tend, 
<laughs> yeah, they, they they tend to be say limited, but they are out there. They're not they're not the minor they're not the majority, unfortunately. I want to get your opinion on because I've seen it all too often in sport, and I'm guessing you have too, where somebody has a back injury, and then all of a sudden you see the fucking people doing like their X band walks, and like they're never moving their spine again. Like, why? in the actual fuck is that what the common narrative is and how can we change it? Like, so again, what Fernando said there, how can we, we got an audience of young strength and conditioning coaches out there. How can we spin it and get them saying the positive narrative of what we need to be doing out there with a, an expert, you know, on it? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. Um, one is because of dogma, because it's just been said in the past and it just gets repeated time and time again. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way that we've always seen it work so therefore we're just going to stick with it um the other reason i think is litigation fears as well mm, get people good to, call you know, do things that could be dangerous or detrimental and then you getting kicked in the ass financially legally for it as well so i think that's a big driver everybody tends to be overprotective and over guarded uh, because of those fears and concerns uh, and then I think the other one is again is just ignorance is just not being fully aware of you know conflicting and contradictory research and information out there I think people only read what they get put in front of them sometimes and that's sometimes only put in front of them by people that have vested interests and biases into one approach over another and so they tend to get very narrow view of what the research the literature and the evidence tells us works and at the end of the day when you look at the research and literature there isn't much robust evidence that says one thing works superiorly or better than another thing there's lots of different roads to roam um, and again it's about having that that ability to be able to select the right approach the right road for that person in front of you is sometimes you know the skill of a good therapist or coach you know, I never say, you know, spinal flexion and doing your Jefferson curls is something you would use with every case of everybody with back pain, because that's just as fucking daft as saying <laughs> everybody has to do, you know, bird dogs and keep their spines in neutral with every case of back pain. It's about having the ability to select and choose the type of person who's going to be best served with some Jefferson curls, or is the type of person with a back injury who's going to be best served with some bird dogs or keeping their spines in a relatively neutral position as they're doing their deadlifts. So it's, it's just having that non-dogmatic, flexible and adaptable approach. Um, but again, I find that's not often done because it's a little bit harder. It takes a bit more cognitive effort. It takes a little bit more thinking. It takes a bit more time. It isn't as simple or as easy as having a protocol, you know, something that you follow mm. and go from step A to step B to step C with every fucker you see. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes it harder to do this a little bit more flexible and adaptable uh, approach working in the shades of gray nobody likes to do that everybody likes blacks blacks and whites it makes it so much easier <clears throat> what about any of our listeners that are hearing this and they're like okay cool what you know can you give me some good people like you don't need to give uh names of <clears throat> research that you know unless you know that well off the top of your head but if you're like hey you know go out and find these researchers so that way you can go to your administration and be able to push for things and the reason i'm saying it is um i remember back you know like knee pain everybody was like oh do nothing do nothing and then it was like Ebony Rio and um, Jake Turin, and other people had Jill uh, Cook, I think, you know, there's more and more research that people could kind of give to their physios or people at school to be like, hey, look, research shows I can do some shit. Is there people that you'd say, hey, strength coaches listening out there, go find these people? Well, again, it very much depends on what area and what problems you want to look into. But if you're talking something like back pain, you know, to get a alternative approach to the most common narrative out there, you know, we're talking Stu McGill, spinal stability, super stiffness and all that sort of things to reduce risks of back pain. You know, the contrary side of that, the alternative side of that, the research I'd recommend is reading stuff around Peter O'Sullivan. So Peter O'Sullivan did his cognitive functional therapy approach, which is a much more patient centered, individualized approach, looking at not just the biomechanics, but also, you know, the lifestyle factors and things around it. So I definitely recommend, you know, some reading of Peter O'Sullivan's background there for, for back pain, you know, and another really useful paper that I found was some of Michelle Hazenbring's work. And she is a psychologist who worked a lot in people with phobias and she then started to branch into pain 
and she started to realize that you know there's there's there tends to be two types of approach of strategies of dealing with pain pain avoidance or pain endurance so we're either avoidance copers or endurance copers uh, and I find you know that some of her work has been really useful in helping me clinically reason which type of approach is probably better to take for the person in front of me based on their their strategy that they've adopted for this current situation that they're in so uh, again pain avoidance and pain endurance coping uh, are two very useful sort of uh, strategies that people have and say Michelle Hazenbring's work has been very uh, good on that. No, those are awesome. I, I wrote those down. I think other people will. Sticking down with what you said, it depends. For any of our listeners out there that may be young and they're continuing to learn, what is the simple it Monday... Be, sorry, it should be the old people as well. They should also True. be listening. True. And also learning. True. You're right. I'm sorry. What would be your... It's Friday right now. What would be your, hey, someone's going to listen to this and then they go to work on Monday... What would be that Monday morning explanation of the difference between a pars fracture and a, a spondy, right? Like let's talk, you know, we'll stick with the back and then we could talk um, a bulge that went, you know, anterior, posterior and lateral and whatnot. So the, the, the clinical difference is going to be very minimal, you know, between those two presentations. Um, so you're probably going to struggle to have any strong certainty that you're dealing with one type of pathology over the other unless you get some image in there. But the question I have is, do you need to have that imaging to be able to direct your management and treatment? Because they don't really have any specific treatments. Because normally with a spondy or a pars articularis defect, it's normally graded activity and return back into the things they can't do that governs how we manage them. It's not really the pathology. It's their presentations of their pains and their problems. The only thing you've got to be concerned about is, the, you know, is that there could be a other secondary differential diagnosis which might be a little bit more serious and sinister that might need some further interventions either some surgical interventions you know so if you've got something that is unstable or you know god forbid tumorous or cancerous mimicking any of these conditions then obviously the sooner that's addressed and rectified the better but if you've got none of those sort of gl serious glaring concerns then does it matter whether you, you're treating somebody with a spondy versus somebody with a pars articularis defect? And the simple answer is 99% of the time, no. Because that isn't what governs how you progress them or regress them. It's their reaction and their symptoms that they have or don't have on the tasks and activities you ask them to do. So that's, that's my, my approach a lot of the time. Now, I don't need a specific diagnosis to help people. You know, I have my suspicions a lot of the time in everybody that's part of the clinical reasoning process but it doesn't mean that I if I'm uncertain it doesn't mean I can't proceed with helping people um, for anybody that has the in you know for your own case too that has the radicular nerve pain or do you recommend taking you know prescriptions of gabapentin or things to help with the pain or no like I don't I'm, yeah. I'm curious on the smile so yeah no so my, my personal experience here was quite interesting so you know when I was awake every 45 minutes during the night because of this neuropathic pain and it was really fucking unpleasant. I thought, yeah, I've got, I've got to try and get some sleep. So I want to get something to get this pain under control. So I went and spoke to my doctor and they suggested these neuropathic painkillers and, and I tried them for a couple of weeks and they made absolutely fuck all difference. I had minimal positive experiences with any of these neuropathic painkillers. So I didn't get a very good response, but I've heard other people say they were like magic. They, they significantly reduced their pain a lot. Why they didn't work for me, I, I have got no real strong ideas, you know. Maybe it was because of the type of nerve root issue, I think with maybe more the mechanical compressions rather than inflammatory compressions. So if you have you've got a disc prolapse or a part of the disc that's compressing mechanically onto the nerve root, I don't think the neuropathic painkillers are gonna be as effective as if you've got some sort of inflammatory irritation to the mm. nerve root. That yeah. may be a reason why, but that's just a guess. Um, but no, I think, you know, when you're trying to get pain under control, again, there are lots of different options for you. Pain can be modulated in some really unusual ways a lot of the time, you know, yeah. and it's not only analgesia and pharmacology that can do that. Movement can be a great painkiller, mm -hmm. you know, massage, manipulations, they can be great painkillers, but that's all you're doing is you're, you're playing around with the symptoms. So I often tell people, you know, it's not about, 
you know, just trying one, it's sometimes trying a number of them, seeing which one gives you the best bang for your buck with less side effects. So, you know, experiment when you've got these type of symptoms and see what works for you. For me, the one that worked well for me after experimenting a lot of times, hot baths and a glass of red wine. Fucking right. Fucking magic, mate. Absolutely reduced my pain the most. I mean, temporarily, wasn't anything lasting long periods of time, but just gave me those two or three hours of significant pain reduction. So if anybody wants my cure for radiculopathy, hot baths and red wine. <laughs> How about traction? Do you, do you use, do you, and again, I know, I'm know i assuming the answer is going to be depends, but traction at the lower yeah, extremity or it, upper? It does depend, but it has, again, very short-lasting effects, and those effects are probably not worth the time, energy, and costs of going to get it. So, you know, there are, it's that cost-reward ratio, you know, I think, you know, the risk-reward ratio as well, but there's also costs, time, energy, effort, etc., and I think a lot of the time with these type of manual therapy traction type treatments, there's a lot of time to get a small lasting effect that just doesn't seem to be worth it for me. And then the last one that I've read research on and have you know tried to push for anybody is the sensory deprivation float tanks. I like them, have used them. What are your, again, I'm assuming it's gonna be depends in case by case, but just wanna hear your opinion on it. I've not actually heard of those for pain reduction at all. So that's a new one on me. Yeah, no, the, the place that I go, I'm actually going tomorrow, um, but the people, uh, the guy had back pain forever and kind of researched it, and then, you know, we were going back and forth, and that's how I was able to get the school to pay for kids to go. We'd say, oh, they have back pain, and throw the guise of getting them in there that way. Interesting. I suppose well, there you go. Hey, I, I, I provide, like, right, right there. We're fucking ending the show right here. I was able to provide some content and some, uh, some help for him. Um, I want to respect your time. We, we've been on here for 52 minutes. Um, if anybody wants to follow you and continue to learn about, you know, hot uh, bathtubs, a hot bath and uh, red wine or any of your other home remedies, where can they follow you? Where can they find you if they don't already know where you are? Because you have a massive following on social media. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a social media whore. So I'm across all the platforms. You can find me on most. I'm even on fucking TikTok. Man. Holy I'm shit. Not. Look at you. Oh, no. Doing one of these, I'm, though, just dances and yeah, I'm not, I'm not in the bikinis and doing the dancing now, quite yet. I quite are yet. those Cleto Rays behind you? I see the Cleto Ray boxing gloves behind you. They're flies. flies. They're flies. Okay. I mean, you, you, you gonna have some TikToks? You just beating people up too? Like you stupid fucking. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, no, I say uh, I've used TikTok for its uh, social media algorithms and, it, and its uh, technology. Actually, I think it's one of the better platforms with all its amazing green screen features and stuff like that. But. I hardly use it for any engagement or anything along those. I'm mostly on, um, what's it, Instagram and uh, Twitter. So it's just under my name, Adam Meekins, or you can look me up under the sports physio as well. Man, I appreciate you being and, and giving us some time at the end of your day. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest yeah. of your day. No worries. Thanks for inviting me on. It's been a mm -hmm. pleasure. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.